My name is Ariana Patterson. I've spent this past summer as a research associate with Dr. Kurt Robinson, and today I will be talking about our work on modeling the rates of amino acid degradation for the evaluation of potential biosignatures. So before I dig too much into the particulars of this project, I want to give a little bit of background on amino acids. Many of you are probably familiar with amino acids from a biology course, or some of you may have heard of them in a dietary context even. So why exactly do we care so much about amino acids? The answer is that amino acids are the building blocks of life as we know it. Like these Legos here, they can combine to form a variety of structures, and most structures in this case are proteins. Amino acids are something that we consider a potential biosignature for other worlds because they are very closely associated with life. So some of those worlds that we might look for amino acids on are icy ocean worlds. So here we have Europa um, and we have Enceladus. And we believe that these moons formed from the accretion of materials similar to what we find in carbonaceous meteorites. Carbonaceous meteorites are a particular type of meteorite that we've observed to contain amino acids. Specifically, we've seen glycine, um, the simplest amino acid. So since we believe that these moons formed from a similar material, we would expect that they had a similar chemical composition at the time that they came into being. So if we talk about the structure of these moons, both of them have this icy outer layer that you can see here, and beneath that are oceans with hydrothermal activity. And that hydrothermal activity is very lucky for us because it results in these geysers that eject water from below the moon surface to a level where a flyby mission, like in the artist's depiction here, could collect water samples that we could test for amino acids. So if we think about amino acids, they have a shelf life of sorts. Over time, whatever amino acids you started with are going to begin to disappear in a process kind of following a curve like this. And so this is useful from a biosignature point of view, because if we expect that these moons started with some concentration of amino acid, and we get a reading that is above what we think they would have with the natural decomposition, that means that there's some process below the moon's surface that is replenishing amino acids, and that process could potentially be life. So here, one of the key things that we have to do is figure out what exactly is the shape of this decomposition curve. And that's where we're going to begin to turn to chemical kinetics. So chemical kinetics is essentially the study of rates of chemical processes. And in a paper in 2019, Trong et al. took a look at this question of amino acid decomposition on icy ocean worlds. And they used a very simple um, form of the amino acid decomposition, just looking at all of the processes as one occurring at some rate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, this is a good start, but it also overlooks a lot of complexity. So we can look at glycine as an example and say, what kind of things can happen to glycine? And there are a lot of them. So these are a couple of different decomposition pathways. One is deamination, where this amine group is lost. Another, decarboxylation, where the carboxylic acid is lost. And then there are still others as well. And all of these processes occur at different rates. Then beyond um, decomposition, amino acids can also gain complexity. They can join together, they can polymerize, and they can form peptides. And that has its own rate as well. Then to add just even a little bit more complexity, these processes can also occur in the reverse direction. And those reverse processes, yet again, have their own separate rates. So for those of you who maybe don't have a formal chemistry background, I understand that this might be a little bit overwhelming, but I promise you, we're not gonna be handling all of this complexity today. We're specifically going to be looking at the decarboxylation pathway and talking about a pH effect. So the duration that um, an amino acid persists is going to depend on factors like temperature and pH. And what's going on with pH is that glycine doesn't exist in just one form. Depending on the pH, there are a variety of different forms of glycine. At low pH, you have glycinium, the positively charged species. At high pH, you have the negatively charged species, glycinate. 
And why this matters to us is that these different forms of glycine are going to undergo the processes above at different rates. And currently, the pH of these icy ocean worlds is not really well known. So it could span quite a range, going from mostly the glycine Zwitter ion in the middle to mostly glycinate. And that makes a big difference in what we might expect to be the level of glycine today and what we might interpret as a biosignature or not a biosignature. So in order to get into this, we really need to have a model that's able to handle this complexity. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of generating this model from giving it data, building it out, and then interpreting that data. So to start, we have the data for our model. For this model, we used data from Lee and Brill, published in 2003, and they ran a series of experiments for glycine decarboxylation at a variety of temperature and pH. So we took the rate constants that they published and sort of backcast a dummy set of data, if you will, for the concentration of glycine over time. And then to take it a little bit further, we applied a very simple decarboxylation reaction. Glycine goes to methylamine and carbon dioxide, which gives us something like this. You can see glycine slowly goes away. It's replaced by carbon dioxide and methylamine. Methylamine here is, is hiding behind the carbon dioxide. Um, so this data is great. It's really clean. But that's actually a little bit of a problem because real data does not look this nice. Real data has variability. And if we want to test our model, we want to give it data that has that variability to work with. So in order to add that, we used um, just a Gaussian noise generator that gives us something like this. You can see the trends are still here, but the data isn't quite as clean. And another way that we can look at the same information is by looking at the allocation of carbon between different compounds. So most of the carbon starts off in glycine. It gets replaced by roughly equal proportions of carbon dioxide and methylamine. And so now there's a little bit more we have to do before this is data that we can give our model. Because like I mentioned before, glycine has different forms at different pHs, and those different forms matter. So we took this data and we fed it into a thermodynamic model that broke it up into the different species. So we have mostly glycine, as you can see, but a little bit of glycinate. And for methylamine, we also have not just methylamine, but methylammonium. And so this makes a difference throughout the course of our experiment because it affects pH and it affects the rates at which decarboxylation is going to take place. And so this set of data with all the different species and all the different forms is what we eventually fed to our model. And our model worked roughly like this. We built it out in Python and the core is this kinetics function. So in this kinetics function box, you have a variety of differential equations representing all of the various chemical processes we expect are occurring in the experiments. So we take that function and we give it the data from all 21 experiments, that data that I showed in the previous slide, um, and then we give it random initial guesses for the various kinetic parameters we want it to solve so that it has somewhere to start. And then we let it iterate over time through this objective function, which is seeking to minimize the error between the values predicted by the model and the actual experimental data. And then at the end, it gives us the fitted kinetic parameters, which is what we're looking for. So for the results from a model, this is one of the fits that it produces for the same experiment I used as an example previously. You can see it's fitting pretty well. There are definitely still some areas to improve. Um, but when you take 21 of these, you can get these kinetic parameters. And I understand this is probably a little bit messy to look at. Um, and I agree, it's not, it's not the most easy way to really interpret the data, but luckily we have things like this Arrhenius plot that makes it a little bit more clear. So here you're seeing the um, inverse of temperature and the natural log of the rate constant, the rate constant being more or less what we look at to say, how quickly is this reaction proceeding? And you can see there is a marked difference between the rate of decarboxylation for glycine and the rate for glycinate, and that's consistent with a little bit of variability in magnitude across a variety of temperatures. And then another way that we can also look at this and kind of the end goal of this modeling process is the half-lives of decarboxylation. So here I have half-lives at zero degrees Celsius and at 300 degrees Celsius. And you can see there's a big difference just based off temperature. But what I'd really like to call your attention to is these two sort of jumps that you can see in both figures. 
So these jumps represent the transition from having mostly the glycine's witter ion, that middle species that I showed you a little bit earlier on, and mostly um, glycinate, that negatively charged species that was on the far right of the figure. And so that difference is really quite significant. It's roughly four orders of 10. Um, and so from a perspective of trying to evaluate, is this a biosignature? Is it not? That's really significant and something that we definitely want to make sure we're taking account of when we start getting samples from these icy ocean worlds. And so this is really kind of step one of a process. There are definitely things that we would like to do with this model going forwards as well. One might be to integrate other decomposition pathways such as deamination or to adjust the kinetics based on activities. So currently we're using concentrations but there's this other sort of concept um, of an activity, which really represents more the true availability of a species to participate in chemical reactions. So those are some ways we might improve the model itself. We might also branch out with the model a little bit. We looked at glycine, but there are other amino acids that maybe we would want to think about, maybe alanine. Um, and currently, as I mentioned, we've used sort of dummy data generated from um, from previously published papers, but it would be good to test this out with real experimental data as well and make sure the model is still functioning as we expect it to. And so those might be activities for the future. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it off there and I'm happy to take any questions. Fantastic, great job, Ariana. I see. Uh, ben Crawford has a question. Go ahead, Ben. Can you unmute? There you go. Hi. Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, I don't know if you researched this part of biosignatures, but I uh, ran into a couple articles where it uh, triggered my curiosity. How do you know the difference between a failed prebiotic system and a biotic system? For example, like with the Milliure experiment, creating these amino acids, um, mm -hmm. how do you know if it just stopped there in the environment or went further to create life and leave those amino acids? Yeah, that's a really good question. Off the top of my head, I definitely don't have a great answer, but I would think that if it never really progressed to life to something that could sustainably produce amino acids, we'd probably get a reading that's maybe a little bit higher than we expected if some were made. Um, but it would probably be a difference in magnitude. And that's definitely something that would be maybe a little bit challenging to tease out and, and get into significance of readings versus insignificance. Yeah. But that's a cool thing to think about. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.